Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path. I'm your host, Mike Allen. Well, they call it the Old Woodbury Path. It was a critical lifeline for the earliest settlers of western Connecticut. This 21-mile path gave those settlers the only possible way to get their crops to market by connecting all the inland farms in the 1600s to the most vital port in western Connecticut at that time, the Port of Derby. Without this path, they may not have survived and those settlers may not have prospered. All this was 350 years ago and the very existence of the path, not to mention its route, was nearly lost to history. But thanks to our guest today, Pete Rosam, we actually know quite a bit about the path. He's a local historian from Seymour who spent much of the last 10 years of his life piecing together details of this nearly lost forever path. It's simply a great story, and Pete will be along in just a moment to tell us all about it. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. When people need the best quality health care, there's a reason they turn to Yale New Haven Health. In 1826, Yale New Haven Hospital became Connecticut's very first hospital. They were the first hospital in the U.S. to use chemotherapy. Yale New Haven was the first to introduce insulin pumps for diabetic patients. And they introduced the world's first intensive care unit for newborns. For more information about Yale New Haven Health, visit YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. Regular listeners to Amazing Tales CT just might remember the episode we did on something called the Old Connecticut Path. It's a roughly 100-mile-long path, and it connects Cambridge in Massachusetts to Hartford. That's where Thomas Hooker led 100 Puritans from the Massachusetts Bay Colony back in the 1630s to the eventual state capital of Connecticut, where he founded the city of Hartford. Well, that path was walked 400 years ago, and parts of it are still walkable, just like in the old days. Well, today we're going to have a similar story, except it's a path in western Connecticut. Now, this path is only about a fifth of the length of the old Connecticut path, but the old Woodbury path was also critically important to Connecticut's developments. This 21-mile path connected Woodbury, which at the time was a small but growing community in the first real prominent settlement in that part of the state, with Derby. Now, why Derby? Well, Derby had a very important thing going for it back in the 1600s, and that was that Two rivers intersected, the Housatonic and the Naugatuck, right where Derby's located. Now, in those days, a river intersection was just as good as a highway intersection is today. In fact, Derby was called, believe it or not, the New Boston. It was the first major port in western Connecticut developed for trading food grown in Connecticut with the Caribbean, where molasses, sugar, and other commodities could be obtained. Now, the development of the old Woodbury Path opened up a large section of the state to further development. It was the first major overland trading path developed, and it connected all of sort of northwestern Connecticut to the East Derby Landing, which was the name of the port in Derby. Now, we know about this path due to the painstaking efforts of Seymour resident Pete Raza. Pete has dedicated the last 10 years of his life to piecing together both the actual route as well as the backstory of the path, including the development of Derby and Woodbury. So, Pete, I've gotten to know you over a couple of months now, probably a year since you and I first touched base. And what amazed me from the first time that you and I spoke was the fact that you have devoted 10 years of your life, now more than 10 years, uncovering this path. It's so important historically. The first question I'm going to ask you is, what got you on this this path of tracking down the path? Well, my wife, Barbara, and I are ardent hikers. We live in an area where there are a lot of different trails that people don't really know about. And I was asked by the Seymour Land Trust uh, about 11 years ago to lead a hike in the Seymour area, Ansonia area, where people become more interested in it. So we agreed, and we wound up at Fountain Lake in the Seymour and Sonia border. We met three guys that were artifact collectors. They were looking for 
Native American Point ATVs were coming in there, unfortunately, and they would dig up the land with their tires, and these guys would come the next day, and they would find Native American points there. And some of them were paleo points from 8,000 years ago. And then we were talking during a conversation. We were asked if we had known there was a stagecoach road in that, that area, and I had no idea that was anything like that in Seymour. So he told us where it was, and Barb and I, we uh, took a walk, and we found that there were remains of an old road going up the hill from where we were hiking at Fountain Lake. We followed it up, crossed over a main road, and it kept going past an ice dam and an ice lake. That whetted our appetite. We decided to do a little research on it. We went back a couple weeks past that, and then we met a, one of the old-timers there, and he took us on a tour of another section of the old road that led down from Fountain Lake to Route 8 and Ansonia. And this was a wide road built up on the lower side by huge boulders, and it was more than a farm road. It was an old ancient road made for carts. Now, let me interrupt you here for a second because I think this is important for people to understand. What's the difference between a farm road and the path that you're talking about? Can you kind of define those a little bit? A farmer owned probably 100 acres at that time. That's about most he can handle. And he had little roads that would lead to his fields. One lane and only made for a tractor or for a cart. But a road, an ancient road, was two cart roads wide. It was made for a smooth riding with carts or with other stagecoaches, perhaps, or other wagons. And it led from one place to another. It wouldn't just end at the farmer's land. It kept going. We did a lot of research on it, and we found that there wasn't much in the literature in this area. We found the three old history books for Derby, Seymour, and Woodbury, and we found bits and pieces of a road called the Woodbury Path or the Old Road, the Old Stagecoach Road, the road leading over Rockhouse Hill and so on. By putting it all together, we were able to determine that it was more than a farm road. It was actually a transport road between two cities. And what you found out was it was a historic 350-year-old road. And the significance of this, and this is what amazed me the first time I talked to you about this story, was when you said, you know, Derby was at one time called the New Boston because they had so many plans to build up this port. I'd never heard this story, and I'm going to hazard a guess that most of the people in the audience haven't heard this story either. So let's talk about this. Back in the day when we had Native American hiking paths and we had rivers, you know, before the turnpikes got built, the the dirt turnpikes got built, you can imagine a, a sailboat going up the Houstonic River. And once they made it 12 miles up, they'd see this gigantic other river, the Naugatuck, coming into it. And right at that point is what today we call Derby, and this is where it all built up. Can you take the story from there? What happened with Derby? How did it develop, and, and why did it become such a thing? Well, the Dutch were the first to explore the area, and then eventually they were moved out by the English from New Haven. And that was an important point of the confluence between the Naugatuck and Housatonic Rivers. It was a trading area, and Native Americans have been there for at least 8,000 years, so they developed many paths that uh, weren't available for the English to know about until they got there. There was a lot of natural resources. They were able to grow crops there. And as the years went by, Derby added more and more farms, more and more people. They were able to have excess product. So they needed more than just the crops they were growing there. They needed to get material from from Europe or from West Indies, such as molasses or rum or cotton, they built the seaport on East Derby called East Derby Landing. And they were able to build ships, sloops, and schooners that were able to transverse the uh, Housatonic River and 12 miles back to Long Island Sound. And they became experts. They became farmer sailors, go to the West Indies, and bring back the goods that the farmers needed. It got to be very profitable, and eventually East Derby was starting to be called the New Boston. It was competing with the Boston and New York harbors, whereas New Haven and Bridgeport were still a little bit behind the times. And then you get people who are starting 
to want to settle the inland part of what we would call Western Connecticut, sort of uh, New Haven County, Litchfield County. And the state legislature was happy to have more development occur there, too. And so finally, 15 guys and their families from Stratford, they got the approval from the state to go up to present-day Woodbury and start something. So this is where I think it's hysterical because they said you go up the river, you take a right on the Pomperog River. It's, it's sort of like road directions today except they were with rivers. And they looked at the Pomperog and they said, ah, they must not have meant that right. And they went up to the next one, which was the Chapog River, and said, yeah, we'll take this one. So they got off the wrong <laughs> exit of the river. But explain from there what happened. They had their 15 men their wives, their children, and they were in canoes and rafts. I mean, this is just crazy. And how many miles did they go and tell us that story? It's about 30 miles from Stratford to uh, present-day Woodbury, Southbury area. And it's an amazing story. They sailed up against the tide, against the current, with their families, made that trip. They didn't listen to their wives who got mad at them for taking the wrong turn. You didn't ask for directions, honey. Now we're in the wrong town. So they wound up in Roxbury. They couldn't go any farther because of the falls and the rocky area. So then they knew that they had made a mistake. They decided to cross over the hills there. They saw before them a big wide expanse called the Pomperog. That was what granted them by the state. So they went down there, their families and little kids. I don't know how old they are, but it, you know how hard it is to travel with kids today, which you could imagine in a raft or a canoe. They wound up in the Settlers Park in Southbury, stayed there for a couple nights, and then determined that it was a floodplain. They eventually moved to where Woodbury is located. They lived there on their farms for a year before they decided that they needed to make a mill there. So they sent two fellows on horses back to Stratford to pick up two millstones, which were only about two and a half feet wide. And then they, they came back with them. These two riders on horses, they took a Native American path that led from Woodbury all the way down to East Derby. And then they forded the river there and went another Native American path to Stratford, picked up their two millstones, carried them between two horses, and came back to Woodbury. So that's the first evidence I found of the Woodbury path in existence. The Woodbury path between Woodbury and East Derby, one of the greatest commerce roads in this section of the state. And this is the impressive part. It's just like any other colonial development. It took them a while to get crops going to the point where first they were you know, sustaining themselves, and then they had to have excess that they needed to trade and get, like you say, the molasses and other stuff back. So this started to happen more and more. So Woodbury was developed and towns around it. So you had, say, Waterbury and Oxford and Southbury and Litchfield, all these areas, people living in those regions, bringing all this stuff to Woodbury. And they needed to have a better overland transport route to this East Derby Landing to get their stuff out Mm -hmm. into a place where they could trade it with somebody else who could give them molasses, right? Exactly. Now, Woodbury got a little bit of a slower start than Derby. Derby already had about 15 to 20 years of experience on uh, seafaring and uh, bringing their crops to different towns along the coast and even to the Caribbean. Now, in 1675, General Assembly said, well, Woodbury needs to be developed better. So they need to build a road, a formal road between Woodbury and Derby. And they would have to include a ferryman to cross the Nugatuck River and so that the food could be brought down to the East Derby Landing. They were going to do that, but then King Philip's War broke out. And because of the, uh, the brutal nature of that war in the upper New England areas, the settlers from Stratford got very scared, so they all moved back to Stratford. So the plans for this new road and the ferry were put on hold for three years until the uh, war was over. Once the war was over, General Assembly wanted their road to be built, but the settlers from Stratford said, well, we're comfortable here now. It's safe here now. But they didn't want to go back. And they said, well, you're going to have to pay tax from Stratford and in Pomper Rock. So right away, the settlers decided, we're going back to Pomper Rock. So they went back there. 
It became a center for the Litchfield area. Other towns up in Litchfield County were being developed, and they needed also a place to bring their crops to a market in exchange for material that they couldn't buy here. Now, this path, I, I know you weren't there and didn't oversee construction and how it was done, but you've been able to use your detective skills to find out things. There's something, for example, called a thank you, ma'am. Would you explain what a thank you, ma'am, is on a trail like this? Well, one of the uh, portions of the uh, Woodbury Path had to um, move up to Great Hill Road. It was the hilly road. It was about 500 feet difference between that and sea level. And in order to do that, if, if a cart was going straight up the hill, he'd have the horses or the, the oxen would have a tough time. So what they did was make a series of, of switchbacks that go up, take a left turn, and then make a right turn, and then they squiggled their way right up to the top. And in between, there were flat areas where a horse can or ox can rest there and um, not have to pull the load up. The horse or oxen would say, thank you, ma'am, for this rest stop, because I, I was getting a little bit tired. Now, one of the other things, you've shown me lots of pictures of this, and it's phenomenal to me that when you got to these parts where you had some hill, they actually had like a two-way road. Right, They had one going up, a lane going up, and a lane coming down. Can you explain that? Again, at Fountain Lake, it's a hilly place, even with thank you, ma'ams. And if a person is uh, riding or on a horse or, or an ox is pulling a heavy load going up the hill and another one's coming down the hill, now who's going to move aside? So what they did was make two lanes. They made one lane for uphill and then the other lane for downhill. That way... The ox carts can pass by without um, interfering with each other. There were so many carts coming up and down the road that in East Derby, going over the Nucktuck River to East Derby Landing, for half a mile, the carts would be backed up. It would take them almost a day for them to unload their material at the shipyards and then return with whatever imported goods they had wanted. So this was about a 21-mile long old Woodbury path, right? And it took, what, two days? There were several ordinaries or taverns along the way where the transporters, the teamsters can spend a night. Um, there were a place called Hell House. People would get together and talk about news because there were very few newspapers back there, and especially they weren't up to date. And they were drinking and carousing and having fun. But that's a place that they could stay over, and there were other more formal inns along the way. The General Assembly said every 70 miles there should be a hotel or an ordinary or tavern along the way so transporters can get a good night's sleep. Some of them are still in existence. So now Derby is having this great explosion of wealth and prosperity but it had a couple problems, right? The Housatonic River, where it empties into Long Island Sound, had a big sandbar that at low tide only allowed three feet of clearance, so you couldn't bring a big boat out there unless it was high tide, number one. And number two, the Derby port itself during the winter, the really bad winters back then, used to freeze over, too, so it wasn't necessarily year-round. And then other areas started to grow up. Is this pretty much what rang the death knell for Derby in terms of being this new Boston? As you mentioned, the Housatonic River is dependent upon tides. It's dependent on, on the weather. Rivers would freeze over in the wintertime, and then in the springtime, the ice starts breaking up into large chunks, and they would start floating down the river, and then they would get stuck usually between bridges and get building up higher and higher and higher. And meanwhile, there's more pressure coming down, and so it would just collapse the bridge. So that was a problem, and then with the increased uh, farming in the area, more and more silt was rushing into the river, too, the Naugatuck and part of the Housatonic, and getting more sandbanks built up along the river and caused uh, some of the ships to be grounded there. At that time, bigger boats were being built in Boston and Newport and New York to go across the ocean. Boats twice or three times as big as the ones that can navigate the Housatonic, so they couldn't handle those in Derby. Second thing, um, the turnpikes were being built around the end of uh, 1700, and those were uh, mostly private affairs where they would come in and straighten roads out and make it more comfortable to, to take a, a trip from one city to the other. 
They went directly to New Haven, which had a deep water port, was open all the time. It was quicker, it was more dependable. The bigger ships coming in, they bypassed the people in Derby, and some of the people in the warehouse in Derby would sit on their porches and watch the traffic go by and not stop at Derby, and they would cry over it. And today, Pete says he himself gets a little bit sad when he thinks of how much of the old Woodbury path has been paved over and forgotten to time. He's pretty concerned about active development projects that are targeting sections of the trail. Now, parts of the original route do still exist, and Pete has managed to map the 21-mile course on the giant board in his living room, which he's preparing to publish, thankfully. And he's had a lot of help from Southbury Town historian John Dwyer. John was there to help pinpoint parts of the path, particularly through his town, and he also added stories about its past youth. All in all, it's a formidable effort, allowing us some 350 years after the fact to be able to go back and get a taste of our colonial heritage. wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. Eventually, the railroads came in, and their tracks were laid right over the East Derby Landing site, right where it once proudly stood as Western Connecticut's new Boston Harbor. Believe it or not, though, steamships continued to service the Housatonic River until the 1920s, and get this, a person in Litchfield could take a stagecoach to Derby, hop aboard a steamship and go to New York City, all for just $2.50. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Pete Rosen, and his wife, Barb, who not only supports all of her husband's research, but she drove Pete and I up and down much of the path during my recent visits. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. Stay healthy.